of this convention is, is very significant, I feel, to focus on Christ for productivity. You, many people try to focus on Christ, but not for a purpose. We have a reason to focus on Christ. And I feel like the message God has given me is going to, it's going to be a blessing. It will be a seed. It will indeed be a seed. Uh, let me just pray for a moment. Heavenly Father, we look to your word and we depend on your Holy Spirit to inspire it to our hearts, to cause us to become carriers of the truth that you give to us. So bless the women, bless Quifi. And as we look at the word of God together, may we become what it announces in Jesus' name, amen, amen. Now, there are, there's something that, that is, is always on my heart. I, I travel all over the world, and I, I'm in many places, many churches, and I see that there are two things that are very important for the believer to, to know. Generally, the knowledge is, is gaining among believers on the first, and that is who we are in Christ. We, we, it takes time for us to study and learn really who we are so that we're redeemed, we're, we're not guilty, our sins are gone, we, we have right standing with God, we are daughters of God. That's who we are in Christ. But the second important truth is vital, and I see it is not as often emphasized. But I feel in my spirit that in this convention, this is the spirit that, that our Archbishop, my wonderful sister and friend, is, is desiring to convey to the women of Quifi. And that is who Christ is in you. Who Christ is in you. When we focus on Christ, we begin to discover that he is the energizer for all that we do. Now, let's look at a scripture. It's an amazing scripture. Let me just read it to you. It is in John, the Gospel of John, chapter 14. And I'm reading from verse 12. Most assuredly, I say to you, the one who believes in me, the works that I do, he or she will do also. And greater works than these will he or she do because I go to my father and whatever you ask in my name that I will do that the father may be glorified. And then he repeats it in verse 14. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Powerful scripture. And you know, the, the words in these verses when we hear them, we love them, we say amen, but we really wonder, is it really possible? How could we do anything greater than what Jesus Christ did? So this is something that the, the Lord wanted us to understand. Let us, let's, let's consider, we are living in changing times, dramatically changing times. Opportunities are greater than ever before. There are things happening that are forcing communities and cultures and nations to think new about many, many things. You see, Jesus came into the world during changing times. He came into an unsettled time. And he gives us an example of what we do. He came and redefined religious tradition. Think about it. You read the Gospels. He came, he didn't, he didn't destroy the old. He redefined and gave new meaning to the traditions of the Jewish community. He also resisted systems that demeaned people. He talked to women. It was not culturally acceptable for a Jewish man to talk to a woman in public, but Jesus did. 
He touched women. Oh, a Jewish man should never do that. But Jesus did. He trusted women as his witness. That was not acceptable in the legal system of Jesus' day. But Jesus trusted women to be his witness. So there are so many things that Jesus did to challenge and resist the cultures or the traditions that were demeaning people. And of course, that's very important to us as women. And of course, he challenged so many norms. So we understand that as now people of God, we will be agents of change in our world. That's what every queefy woman is. Wherever she goes, whatever chapter she is in, however she conducts her business, however she uses her influence, she is changing the atmosphere wherever she is. Now, I want us to look at something very specific, and this is the focus that I want you to grasp during our brief time together. A tremendous dramatic shift in responsibility happened after Jesus rose from the dead. Now, reflecting on Jesus' final words, in each of the four Gospels, we, we discover words that were Jesus' uh, last instructions to his followers. You know he was sharing the things that were the most important for his followers to remember. At the end of Matthew, he says, this is after his resurrection, he says, all power in heaven and earth has been given to me. You therefore go and make disciples of all nations. Of course, baptizing them and teaching them all that I have taught you. Powerful. Now, that's a big commandment. The people he was talking to, how could they go to all nations? I wonder if they had the kind of global maps that we have today, where they could lay them out and pray and let the Lord talk to them about the nations of the world. I don't know if the disciples had such at their disposal. So to make disciples of all nations, a huge command. And then at the end of Mark, we know what he said. He said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. How could they do that? They had no, no computers. They had no Zoom. They had no telephones. They had no simple way of traveling or writing correspondence. Everything took time. But Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel, the good news about me, to every creature. An impossible task in the natural. And then in Luke, the gospel of Luke, he said to his disciples, I love these words. He's explaining to them. He says it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead and that remission of sin, repentance would be preached to all nations. Again, he's repeating this impossible task. But then he adds something in Luke. He says, but there you will receive the promise of the Father. So wait, wait until you receive the promise of the Father. Now, sisters, you know that they couldn't understand the promise of the Father. The only promises they could think about were promises in the Old Testament that they had been taught. But even then, the God of the Old Testament was never referred to as Father. He was God. He was Lord. He was the Almighty. He was many things, but it was, it was never that intimate relationship title that Jesus introduced, the Father. So again, in Luke, Jesus is saying things that are overwhelming. And then, of course, in the Gospel of John, to me, this is, this is, this is the most challenging and really of all. After his resurrection, he came to his disciples and he said, peace, receive the Holy Spirit. 
They didn't know what that was. And then he said, listen, as the Father sent me, I also send you. I'm talking about a shift that's beginning to take place. As the Father sent me, I also send you. Whatever sins you forgive are forgiven. Whatever sins you do not forgive are not forgiven. Oh my, what a responsibility. How can that be? Only God can forgive sins. The people of that day, the Jews, they would have to take sacrifice to the temple so that their sins could be atoned for. Jesus' words were so radical. But let's consider what happened on the day of Pentecost. We begin in Acts chapter 1. And I want you, if you have your Bible there, I hope you look at it. There's something I want you to see. It is, uh, let's just begin in verse 4. They were assembled together with them, Jesus and the disciples. And he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but wait. And he repeats this, the prom wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you've heard from me. And then let's skip down to verse 6. There, well, no, let's not skip verse 5. He, he said, for John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Spirit, not many days from now. Mm -hmm. And then verse six, listen, this is, this has a clue. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Look where they are coming from. They're, they're looking to Jesus. They're all during their time with Jesus, whatever problem occurred, he was the solution. He healed the sick. He provided bread. He provided money to pay taxes. He had the words of wisdom. He was the teacher. And so now they're continuing to look to him to say, now will you establish the kingdom? Now they're thinking of David's kingdom, a physical kingdom. Mark, if, if you like to mark in your Bible, circle those words, will you? Very important. And then, of course, in verse 7, he said, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons that the Father has put in his own authority. And verse 8, he answers their question, will you? His answer is, you shall. You shall. Receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you, and you'll be witnesses to me everywhere to the ends of the earth. Now, this is the shift from the will you to the Lord saying, you shall. There's an empowerment coming that shifts the responsibility from to you see, once after Jesus fulfilled his mission on the cross, through his burial, through his glorious resurrection, he had done everything that needs to be done. Consider that, that every need we'll ever have has already been provided through Jesus Christ. It affects how we pray. We don't have to ask him to do things. We remind him of his promises and de declare our faith in his faithfulness and his promise, and we act accordingly. So, so we, we, we sh the shift is happening, it's already happened. Do you see what I'm trying to convey? So, so important. Now, we go to Acts chapter, still we're in one. I want you to see verse 14. They did follow instructions. They went to Jerusalem. They went to an upper room. You know this. But verse 14, we cannot ignore. And they all continued with one accord in prayer with the women. Mary, the mother of Jesus and the brothers. So with the women, there were 120 that were in that upper room, not only the 12, 120. And the women who were part of the entourage of Jesus were there. They were hearing all of these words. I wonder what they thought. 
I wonder, I wonder if they thought these words, these commands, these promises, this promise of the Father, I wonder if they thought that really applied to them as women. Oh, my sisters, the world continues to suppress the voice of women, to put them in a role that's subservient to the men. That is not the redemption model. Yes, there are things in our cultures that, that, are, are, that facilitate families and raising children. And there are many things that women, especially, are gifted in doing. But when it comes to the Christ who is in us, our status in Christ, that is not gender specific. And any tradition that causes these huge realities of Christ to be, to be ignored, it's wrong. So we are in Christ, men and women. Christ is in us, men and women. Well, how does that happen? We turn the page to Acts chapter 2. I don't have time to read the entire thing. But it just, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all together in one accord. And there came a sound from heaven like a rushing mighty wind. And it filled the house. And tongues like fire rested on each of them all 120, and they all began to speak in unknown tongues as the Spirit prompted them. And all those who had gathered in Jerusalem for this feast of harvest, they gathered together and they heard, the Bible says they heard the wonderful works of God in their own language. And then Peter stands up to preach. Now, this is the, this is the coward T Peter, the one who denied Jesus. This is the one that just yesterday was so frightened. Now he stands up boldly and he says, these folk are not drunk. No, no, no. This is what the prophet Joel talked about, that in the last days, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. And on your servants and on your handmaids, I will pour out my spirit. So Peter is saying, these are the last days. This is the time. And this is what has happened. Now, I want you to see what this means. What does this mean to us? We are shifting from the will you to the you shall mm. with this promise. And I want you to consider from the time of the day of Pentecost, God has chosen to do his work through people. Mm. Think about it. You came to know Christ because someone told you. You likely received the baptism in the Holy Spirit because someone taught you about him and prayed with you and encouraged you, maybe laid hands on you, but you received. Many of you have been healed because someone else told you that the promises of God were for you to heal you, bring solution in your life. So people convey the message of Christ to people. We are the agents of salvation in the world today. We are the church. We are the kingdom of God in action. But look, look, at, what, look at what happened when the prophet Joel's prophecy was fulfilled. <laughs> look at this. So from now on, everything's going to be different. From now on, it's not waiting for Jesus, one body, one person, the spirit of Jesus, the spirit of God in one person doing everything. No, no, it's all of Christ's followers who are filled with his spirit doing the work. That's why we can do greater works. All of us are doing them. Isn't that wonderful? It's so simple. It's so available to us if we just believe it and act on it. I know so many of you do, but, but look at this, look at this. From that day, from that day, when we look at the, at the experience of the giving of the Holy Spirit, we discover that we are all equal. The, the prophet said, I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh. 
That means that there is no longer special people who have special privilege with God who, who outrank other believers. I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh, all flesh, all flesh. Oh, my sisters, don't let anyone take that away from you. The spirit of God's been poured out on you. No matter your past, no matter your status, no matter your wealth or your education, no matter your title, because you focus on Jesus and believe his words, the Holy Spirit has been poured out on you. The Holy Spirit did not just come for the 12. If that had happened, all of Christianity would be different today. What about... Uh, I'll, my spirit will be on sons and daughters. That means there's no special gender. Women and men, both created in the image of God, are empowered to transform their world by the spirit of God. So there are also no sacred places. Now imagine, in Jesus' day, before the day of Pentecost, there was the holiest of holies in the temple. That was the sacred place. There were places only the priests could go. They were special and places were special. That's not the case. The Holy Spirit came to ordinary people in an ordinary room. What is special is not the place or the certain titled person. What is special is that the Holy Spirit has come to us, the same spirit with which God anointed Jesus of Nazareth. This is, this is a profound truth for us to embody and live accordingly. Now, what about uh, when it says um, the spirit of God uh, will be on the old men and the young men? How about that? That means there is no longer a special age status. A special age status. Old and young are needed in the body of Christ. Old and young, filled with the Spirit of God, have a voice, have a place. The wisdom of the old, the creativity of the, of the young, all are important. I think this is so exciting. And of course, think about social status. Joel said that God was saying on your servants and on your handmaids, men and women servants, those who have no standing in the community, in the village, uneducated, working in a village market, trying to make a living, simple people. Culture looks at them as as not very important. But I'm telling you, when these receive the Spirit of God, they become like all the rest of us. They have a new status, and the status is to be a carrier of the love of God. Now, what when you think about these things, I want to just I want to just remind you there is no special standing or privilege. We all have the Holy Spirit. There's no special gender, no special place. There is no special age. We are all empowered by the Holy Spirit. This is our focus, and this is the truth that the world needs for us to understand. Yes, who we are in Christ, but for the sake of the mission in the world, we have to understand and accept who he is in us. He is in us to do the same thing. We heal the sick. We forgive sin. We cast out devils. We bring solutions. We have answers for the questions and the problems that people have. Oh, my friends, these, these are the words that I just wanted to, to hurriedly give to you, knowing how, how able you are to absorb truth. The Holy Spirit stirs in you to say, yes, that's true. To whatever level you have allowed the Holy Spirit to be the absolute authority and guide in your life, may from today you take that so seriously because we can't just sit back and wait for God to do everything. He's done his part. Now he's depending on us. He's depending on us. And women, that is our high calling. Believe that in Jesus' name. Heavenly Father, 
I extend my voice, your spirit to all who are listening, who will listen later to this teaching, this gathering of your strong women. Father, thank you that we're learning who we are in you so that our complete self-image and our, our comportment spiritually is transformed. But by your spirit, help us to recognize who you are in us so that we take responsibility for what you have assigned us to do. We can go where no man can go. We can speak in ways no one else can speak. We can infiltrate where we, we seem so harmless. Thank you that we carry the power of the resurrected Christ with us to do his work on earth. Let it be, Lord. In the wonderful name of Jesus, we receive and we say thank you. If you agree with that, just say amen right out loud. Amen. 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 Thank amen. you so much, Mama Ladona. 